We all have elections, don't we? The entertainment, the slogans, the promises, the joy of those promises being kept. That's why we keep diligently voting, isn't it? No! <coughs> Hello there, you four and a half million shimmering free souls here. Thank you for joining me on this voyage. Please come and see me between January and May in 2022. I'm all over the UK, but particularly Hammersmith, Margate, Aylesbury. You'll love seeing me there. We'll have a real romp, a real riot. Please, God, everything will be OK. Particularly in this free democracy we live in, the cornerstone of which, as you know, are free elections. Let's examine those free elections, the pledges, promises, slogans, paraphernalia, right now, using the old noggins. David Sirota and Andrew Perez, writing in Jacobin, say... America's real democracy crisis is this. Corporations use a system of legalised bribery to buy public policy, which prevents popular progressive policies from passing and erodes Americans' faith in their government. But otherwise, OK? In 2014, Northwestern and Princeton researchers published a report statistically documenting how lawmakers do not listen <laughs> or care about what most voters want. Was you listening to that? No. Do you care what they said? No. Oh, well, you're in the perfect position to make law for those people that you don't care about or listen to. And instead, mostly care about serving their big donors. What? Serving big donors? But the voting, the phrases, the flag waving, the jumping up and down on the car, all for nothing. Like, imagine when you see those celebrations happen. In my country, a big one was when Tony Blair got in. Everyone was acting like Jesus had come back, Jesus with a guitar. This is going to be great. This is going to be brilliant. It wasn't brilliant. It was the same as usual, with perhaps one or two more wars against Iraq. What about when Biden got in? Yes, Biden. What about that bit when someone said his big, long light arms are out cuddling America and all this stuff? It's like almost extensions of Joe Biden's arms embracing America. It's just absolute codswallop where big donors determine policy and all of us get to do the dancing. I hope you enjoy the dancing because it's the only thing that actually matters. Coupled with additional research documenting the discrepancy between donor and voter preferences, they bluntly concluded that the preferences of the average American appear to have only a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. Minuscule. That's one of the most insulting words in the English language. Statistically non-significant. You can't even make a statistic out of it. And they love statistics. Seven years later, America is witnessing a very public and explicit illustration of this situation in real time. And recent election results are the latest confirmation that the country seems pretty ticked off about the situation ahead of the 2022 midterms. In America's nationalised politics, those elections were dominated by headlines from Washington, where President Joe Biden and Democratic lawmakers have spent months agreeing to whittle down their social spending reconciliation bill at the demand of corporate donors and their congressional puppets. Whittling it. Oh, it's a little whittle that down till it's nothing but a little toothpick, little proddy thing. The cuts almost perfectly spotlight the democracy crisis. Indeed, the specific initiatives being slashed or watered down in Biden's agenda bill share two traits. One, they would require the wealthy and powerful to sacrifice a bit of their wealth and power. Oh, no, there's no wealthy and no powerful. My wealth and power, those are the things that define me. And two, they are quite literally the most popular proposals among rank and file voters. Wow, so if something's popular among rank and file voters, that's everybody, but not popular among powerful, wealthy people, it don't matter. It's irrelevant. The whole thing really takes place outside of a space that you can engage in. Guy Debord, of course, the French situationist Rhino in the late 60s, described situationism as a means of potential protest by creating situations that disrupt ordinariness because of the spectacle of regular life. The regular life has become this spectacle that you observe. And nothing more than an American election demonstrates that theatrical, cinematic, detached, spectacular phenomenon. You're just watching something. You can pretend you're participating. You can pretend you're pontificating. You can even be a pundit commentating. But you ain't doing nothing. You're watching. A top priority for voters is allowing Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices, with 72% saying they support the idea. So that's almost everyone. That's beyond any political party or either political party. People say, why don't we have reasonably priced drugs? So that if you lived in a democracy, that would definitely happen. But hear this. Kristen Cinema, 
friend of the show, and a few House Democrats backed by the pharmaceutical industry managed to block the party's original drug pricing measure from being put into the reconciliation bill. We've done videos on Kristen Cinema and how she accepts money from lobbyists. You can watch that video. I'll point to it at the end of the show. In November, Democrats announced they'd reached a deal on a drug pricing plan which Politico described as far weaker than the Democrats' promised legislation. Far weaker. It's almost not the same plan at all. One industry analyst said the deal seems designed to let legislators claim an achievement while granting pharma protection. Basically, a symbol, a gesture, a veil, a trick, a con. You've been duped if you believe in this stuff. They'll pretend, and we're proud to announce this bill, we're going to do this thing. Remember we said we're delivering on that pledge we did in the election. No, you're not. You're delivering on your relationship with Big Pharma that exists through lobbying, various revolving door relationships between employees. We know this by now. We know this by now. When are we going to do something different? Democrats have largely refused to raise taxes on the wealthy and corporations. Raise taxes on the wealthy. No! Corporations? No! This, even though Biden's own pollsters found that raising taxes on the wealthy was the most popular of more than 30 economic proposals they tested during the 2020 presidential campaign. And I remember seeing him say stuff like that. I remember him going, raise taxes, not on ordinary Joes. Hold on, what's my name? But on uh, rich people, what's my economic status? Oh, this speech is going badly. Many of these findings were summarised in a memo last month from the Biden-aligned non-profit Priorities USA, which warned that there could be consequences if Democrats fail to deliver on their promised agenda. The organisation wrote that its polling found the most popular issue among swing voters was the Democratic proposal to make the wealthy and corporations pay their fair share in taxes. The second most popular item was allowing Medicare to negotiate for lower drug prices. So you want a political party that does that. What's particularly pertinent is these are issues that matter in swing states. To swing voters, Voters. That's not even died in the wall, we'll vote for you no matter what Democrats. That's people that change who they vote for. And they're saying, oh, well, we'd vote for you. You know, we'd forget our previous allegiances if you would do something about Medicare, if you do something about taxing corporations. That's how powerful these corporations are. You would think that the route to power would be to get the votes of people, to win these crucial swing voters and swing states. But when it comes to crunch time o'clock, they're irrelevant. It doesn't matter. It's controlled by the big businesses. So all that data, who cares? Oh, well, we care a bit. We'll say that's what we're going to do because these are hot button topics that get media attention from our compliant, docile pals in media. But we ain't going to do anything about it because we belong to the corporations. The results, new polling data shows that almost three quarters of Americans now think the country is headed in the wrong direction. What an opportunity. What a political opportunity for people that are truthful and honest and have some core principles. Taken together, this is the democracy crisis thrumming underneath all the media noise. The day-to-day -day erosion of democracy by corporations that use a system of legalised bribery to buy public policy, which then erodes Americans' faith in their government. And yet this erosion does not get discussed in a media-directed democracy discourse that focuses almost exclusively on the January 6th insurrection or Republican efforts to deny election results and limit voting. Right. And I suppose that wherever you stand on those issues, by making them centrifugal to reporting and the public conversation, you don't have to deal with stuff that actually matters. Like, are you going to tax corporations? Well, let me just check. Listen, I got some terrible news. There was a guy in a buffalo hat some months ago. He was jumping up and down. The dichotomy is an expression of corporate power. Corruption is omitted from most corporate media coverage because their corporate sponsors are the ones doing the vote buying. By contrast, the insurrection and GOP assault on voting are safe topics for corporate media because they do not threaten the power of the media's corporate sponsors. In Sirota's 2006 book, he called this phenomena the hostile takeover, the conquest of democratic institutions by moneyed interests, to the point where the world's greatest democracy routinely rejects the common sense policies that the vast majority of voters want. The hostile takeover is not merely the rejection of the most popular policies, it's also the media discourse itself. The Washington press is constantly portraying industry bankrolled opponents of majoritarian policies as moderates or centrists and depicting supporters of those policies as fringe lunatics who refuse to be reasonable and compromised. Hey, listen, you said you were going to control drug prices and tax the wealthy. Shut up, you fringe lunatic. 
you want compromise? Compromise? No, but you did say you were going to do it, and everyone once said, you're a lunatic, you're on a fringe, look, get away from that fringe. Meanwhile, there is a pervasive amerta that silences most media discussions of the corporate influence and corruption that so obviously defines American politics, and there is scant mention that the moderate obstructionists are bankrolled by the industry's lobbying to kill the popular policies that Americans want. In short, the takeover is so complete we can't even talk about it or debate it in the public square. And when someone dares to sneak in a mention of it, it's akin to a fleeting glitch in the matrix. The polls showing what people want compared to what's being excised from the reconciliation bill make this part of the democracy crisis impossible to deny. And ending that denial is a prerequisite for achieving something better. Maybe that's why it's impossible to talk about other dominant contemporary global themes around regulation and medicine because they contradict the ongoing media narrative and consensus between government, big business and media. The details of it are sort of irrelevant. You just have to find a way of suppressing the discourse in that particular area because if you were to explore it, you'd start to say, hang on a minute, what's going on between the relationships between media, big business and government? This issue really crystallises it beautifully into one clearly visible shot that makes it easily understood and distilled instantaneously. What a wonderful article there from David Sirota and Andrew Perez. Brilliant piece of writing that excellently illustrates the nature of the institutional relationships that prevent democracy from having any meaning. I found that very resonant, very educational and informative, and it emotionally chimed with the way I see democracy. Now we know, we double know, we treble know. There's no point getting excited about elections. I remember saying this like 10 years ago and people were like, oh, what are you saying? But really, that's all I felt. That's all I understood. That's all I intuited and experienced in my life. But that's just what I think. What do you think? Let us know in the comments below what you think about these, this kind of trident of disingenuity that has become this uh, institutional web of treachery within which we're all forced to live. Let me know in the comments below how you feel about it. Give us a thumbs up if you want to. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on the notification bell. If you enjoyed this video, have a look at this one. Very, very similar. Very, very saucy. And sign up to my Awake side channel. Please sign up for the mailing list as well. I'll tell you what I'm thinking, what I'm reading, what I'm listening to, and we can go on a journey of education together. And if you're in the UK between January and May, come see me, particularly in Hammersmith and all the places in the South. There's a link in the description. Stay free.